morning. Uh, this session is of VSET. Um, today we have Ben Golub from Northwestern, who is going to present social learning in a dynamic environment. This work is joined with Krishna Dasaratha, who is with us as well, and Nirhak. Guest panelist is Kevin Hepp. Uh, the format is well known by now. We have a 60 minute presentation followed by a 15 minute Q&A session. We request all attendees to keep your microphones muted during the talk. However, please post comments in, and questions in the chat. Uh, there will be a link to the slides in the chat in a moment as well. Um, there is also uh, uh, an opportunity to ask questions live in the Q&A session, Q sessions at the end. Uh, this talk is recorded. Before I hand over to Ben, let me remind you that next week we will have Konrad Mierendorf from UCL talking about his work, uh, keeping the listener engaged, a dynamic model of Bayesian persuasions, but all the details and future talks are on our website, in our emails and on Twitter. Thank you, Ben. Um, the mic is yours. Thank you very much for having me. I am um, really delighted to get the chance to present in this seminar, which I've loved watching um, as an audience member. And thanks to um, my co-author Krishna for joining and also for, for um, and especially to Kevin for being our um, discussant. So I hope everybody can see, can, is that, can, can you see the slides? Perfect, okay. Um, so Krishna can, Krishna can currently plausibly claim three affiliations. He's uh, finishing up a pen postdoc and moving to uh, Coles, and then he'll be an assistant professor at BU. And it's been, uh, he's really, he and your, um, it's been an amazing experience collaborating with them on this. So I'm excited to have Krishna here as well to answer questions. Um, so we want to study social learning about so a, a state of the world that's changing. And so um, the kind of, what I want you to imagine is um, a world where there is an external state changing over time. And the, Exactly, you know, uh, so we, we, we wanna, it's not about in many social learning models, we kind of wanna learn a thing using a, a, an unchanging thing. We get private information and the thing, and the question is, does it somehow make its way ultimately into a social consensus or a, you know, an accurate belief held by many people? Here, the world keeps changing. And so people keep getting private information about current conditions. And they also get past estimates of some other people um, by talking to them. Uh, and there's a reason to keep learning forever um, because the state is changing forever. So an example that a, a sort of slightly stylized example that I like is um, when people are um, deciding, for example, whether to what kind of job they might take out of college. Um, they get signals from their own research. They also talk to upperclassmen about the industry and hearing like, are, you know, um, are the are the big law firms getting nicer to their new employees or less nice information that's plausibly, you know, learned socially. Um, so this process is ongoing because the state in question here, the quality of the job drifts around. And the basic question that we organize the paper around, even though we consider other questions, is can decentralized communication in a network among, among people um, who have some kind of, you know, locations that determine who they learn from, can that kind of um, process aggregate information in a reasonably good way? Can we keep up with the state at a good rate, whatever that will mean. And the potential obstacle is that, you know, it could really be that, that the best signals I can get about the state just have some confounds in them that I couldn't, that I can't get rid of. Um, so social learning may be confounded um, and I might not be able to really tease out the, the truth from so kind of social learning echoes and noise, right? And so the question is, what does this happen? When does this happen? I can tell you the punchline right away, which is that sufficient heterogeneity in signal in, in the endowment of information will be the key thing for learning. And heterogeneity means that different people learn from different kinds of private signals. It's, it's sort of you know always assumed in our framework that there's a degree of independence in people's private information. Of course, you need that for uh, hopes of getting, you know, some kind of law of large numbers, some kind of learning, you know, that's not confounded by, by purely random events, but there's, that's not the heterogeneity we're talking about, not only independence of information, but also the fact that different people that I, that I learn from have different types of private information, different distributions, let's say different precisions 
of information about this issue. That's, that's actually a key um, condition for us and one that determines whether learning is good. So I'm gonna tell you um, an illustrative example, okay? And so this example is, in some sense, it contains a, a key idea of the paper. Um, it contains um, a force that's going to answer this learning question. And then I'll tell you how to embed that force. I'm gonna criticize, I'm gonna say that this model is um, okay, but not perfect. And I'm gonna explain first the, the main force and then what we need to do to sort of tell the full story we wanna tell. But the main force is in this example. So what we have in this illustrative example is a single source. This, think of this as a person in, in, um, in the White House. I'm gonna switch examples. So someone who has access to really good uh, information. Um, they see a signal, the source sees a signal about the state, which is the true state, plus eta, which is a noise. That's a private noise. And S somehow reveals their posterior mean to people they talk to. Maybe they just say it, maybe they take an action which reveals the posterior mean that they have about theta given their signal. For example, if theta has an improper prior, then your belief, then the source's belief just is the signal she got. Now, what we have here is a bunch of media outlets. Okay, so these people have access to the source. They can watch or talk to the source and they observe that source's um, be action, so whatever that source chose to do, which let's say reveals the, their signal, and also has private information in the form of an additional little private signal about um, theta, okay? And given those things together, this each of these media outlets is going to write an article where they'll report their posterior mean of theta given what they know, their private information and the source's information. And then, um, you know, the public, so this is the ultimate consumer of the information, and in this example, who we care about, the public is going to see only these actions that the media took and is going to do, do her best to estimate theta or do its best. You know, think of this as many people, but we can collapse them to one. Ultimately, what, what we care about is how well is this person going to estimate theta. And all of the um, noises that I've talked about are independent. So then let me just write, so um, let, let me do a, a really simple thing and write out the media action, a typical media outlets action. Okay, so in this world where the, where, so this action is just, I'm gonna write is equal to the signal. So they reveal their signal basically, right? Um, and then the media action, well, what are they gonna do? They're going to take a, a weighted average of their private signal and their other. So I'll, I'll put here that we're maintain, maintaining that everybody has an improper prior. This is just to make things simple. Um, it doesn't matter, but it makes it completely obvious sort of that people just average, you know, they use their um, just their signals. So this person is going to combine the two signals. The media outlet knows the signal of the source, knows their own signal. And so as from basic you know, normal updating formulas, this is going to be the kind of average that the media outlet takes. And this is, and this is the thing that, a tip, that a, um, the public will observe. The public will observe a lot of these AIs, right? And crucially, the weight here depends on, in principle, depends on the media outlet. The reason it depends is because different media outlets might have different signal precisions over here, right? Different media outlets may have different um, quality private signals. And so if you have a higher quality private signal, you're going to pay more attention to it um, relative to the source. Okay. Now I'm going to claim to you that if all of these sigmas if all of these sigma i's are equal, then all these weights are equal, right? Everybody faces exactly the same kind of problem and they're combined their private signal um, with the sources signal in exactly the same way, right? So here's, this is the key point. If you see, if I show you a billion of these AIs with independent, even if these are all independent, right? Then, what you're going to learn is basically a very, you're gonna learn, and they're using a common W, 
right? So double, these are all equal to W. What you're going to learn is W times the average of these signals, which is theta, which is what you'd like to learn, plus one minus W times the source's signal. And there's no way you're gonna be able to get rid of the source's signal being in each of your, in each of your um, pieces, in each of your observations. So you're, you're gonna get some estimate of theta, but it's gonna be confounded by this echo of kind of the, the source's idiosyncratic stuff. The source is too central here in a sense, and their information messes everyone up. On the other hand, if you, you know, if you had um, different, suppose now these media outlets like these guys had, these were considered good media outlets and they had good private signals, right? So good signals, which means a low, a low error. And these other people over here maybe had bad signals. So good for half of them, bad for the other half. Then things are going to be bad. But things are going to be good, right? Because now P is going to learn the same kind of thing, W theta plus one minus W source of signal, but for two distinct values of W, because depending on whether the media outlet has a good or bad signal, is going to be weighting its private information differently. So I get two linear combinations of the thing I'd like to know, which is theta, and this confound that was bothering me before, and I can learn theta. Okay, so that's why diversity in the types of information endowments my neighbors have is crucial to enable good learning, right? That's that's sort of a key force that will be and the quite and and in this example there was a confound that was potentially worrisome, but this diversity enabled filtering, and um, that force we're going to now of course there were many things about this example that were a little hokey the exact timing I set up. Um, the fact that there was this one very central source that was confounding everyone that might seem realistic in some cases, but um, not always what we want to consider. So what I'm going to explain in the rest of the talk is how to create a more kind of um, a, a less specific social learning setting, which can embed a lot of different structure and show that this same force is still key to the quality of learning that we can obtain. So let me stop here for a second and make sure um, at least get Kevin to audit my presentation of the example and any other questions that people might have. Um, so, so just to understand the structure of the network, the, the picture that you have here, that's going to be exogenous for, for in your talk. Is, is that correct? Exactly. So in the whole talk, we'll have an exogenous structure of who observes whom. The, um, we'll have a different timing, but the network of, observa of observation opportunities is given and fixed. Can I also ask, um, it seems to me you're, you're interested in sort of a benchmark case where uh, there isn't a particular reason to hide or communicate. There is no strategic communication, in other words, here, right? You're just looking at the, the network stru structure effect on reporting as such. Exactly. In fact, I mean, here in this example, and more generally, I just assume these, these people are myopic. My, they, they have, if, if I wanted to put a utility function to justifying their actions. They're myopic. All they want to do is take the best action for the state. And other people can observe that, but they don't care about anything that, that happens after they take their actions. So we get, you know, sincerity through myopia. You could, some other papers assume sincerity, but we're not going to be thinking about strategic um, distortions. And to, uh, that that's a key that, you know, the kind of traditional in the social learning literature to think about the purely informational externalities as opposed to sort of more active manipulation. Okay, so feel free to bring me back to this. I'm happy to come back and talk about this example more, but I'm now going to tell you about, I'm gonna tell you about the model, okay? So the general model has, is kind of, is maybe a more, you know, general seeming, or it, it, it's, a, it's a version of, it, it can to some extent embed everything we said, but it's going to have like, it's going to look more like a, a model, you know, that you could portably take to, any kind of network and um, that you had in mind. So time is going to be discrete. We're going to be able to consider either time starting or time just having gone on forever. The latter is natural in our case because we have um, stationary, we're going to be interested in purely stationary outcomes. So it's helpful to have a universe that doesn't start for that. And critically, the state is going to evolve according to an AR1 process. So theta t is going to be equal to rho theta t minus one. Um, plus 
an innovation, the news, um, the news are innovations. Um, and as a mnemonic, you know, um, if you if you say news, then it reminds you of the newspaper. These are the things that change in the state from period to period. Um, and rho is a persistence parameter. And we're going to base normalize these news to be normal zero, one. Now, just in, as in our example, agents are going to get signals about the state and also observe the prior actions of some others. Now, the observation opportunities are structured like this. There's a uh, network, in general, directed of n nodes. And for each node, actually, this should say node, okay, for each node i, it has a neighborhood, which is that, which is that places or people that I can observe, okay? Um, so that's the basic, it sort of generalizes the, um, the example, people can have any kind of, um, well, we, I'll tell you the de more detail about, the private, about how the private signals work in general in a second, but this is the state and its evolution, um, as well as the network. And here is a picture of an AR1 process, uh, just in case you haven't personally met one before. And here is, so here the state is moving around. Sometimes it moves like a lot from period to period. Um, and then what I really want to emphasize is what the signals look like. This is, I'll tell you in math in a second, but private signals are draws around the current state. So before acting, everybody has a, a signal, just like in the example of the state contemporaneous with their action, the state they're really trying to match. is just distributed as the state plus an idiosyncratic error, but critically, different individuals can have different levels of precision in their information. So here I've just put everybody, you know, um, you can think of this as everybody's signals, um, maybe in a world where they all have the same signal precision, but they don't need to. Okay. So we study, related to our previous discussion about myopia, just to make completely rigorous our abstracting away from any, you know, strategic issues, which are interesting, but which are, you know, even the basic problem is hard. We're going to study an overlapping generations model, which is going to make everybody's short actions, you know, um, both coherently optimizations, but also, you know, ignoring the future, ignoring any kind of um, strategic externalities. And so the, I just reminded you of this setup and like several papers in the social learning literature, we have this overlapping generations population. So someone, so this is an important slide in terms of exactly how you, the exact sort of structure of our model. Someone is born at every time period. So the network consists of nodes. Think of these as locations, right? There's a bunch of locations, but each of these locations is populated by a kind of a dynasty of people. And a person is born um, at some time T minus M, maybe in college, you're born three, three, three periods, three years before you have to make your decision. During the time that you uh, are kind of a passive learner, you sit around and just watch actions taken by, you know, juniors, seniors um, at, actions around. So maybe where did this junior do their internship, things like that, things that reveal their belief about the state. And you also get now at some point you are a senior and it's time for you to act. And at that time you receive your own private signal about the state, you do your research. Um, and that signal looks like theta t plus eta i t. It's just for you, the time t agent, that's your private private um, signal. And, at, and then finally you are going to estimate do your best to take an action matching the state. So AIT is just going to be the subjective expectation of theta t given all your observations, which is what? Which is, you know, all these AJs. And so now, being lazy for the rest of the talk, I'm actually just going to do uh, one, one generation, one period childhood. Um, it's not important for most of what we say, but it does save a lot on writing. So you see the yesterday actions of all of all the people, and of course you see your own private signal. So um, and these are the J's in the neighborhood of your node, right? Um, can so I ask some? Can I ask a question here, uh, which is unfortunately about m larger than one case? Yeah, totally. Um, which I know you don't want to talk about, but um, sort of. I, 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 if my m is larger than one, as I'm sort of going through my life, um. Am I always seeing the same neighbors, like the same locations? 
Exactly. So this is this is actually why I, I like the college example because this is a thing about the model that I'm honestly not not crazy about because it does feel like the real life network is some sort of like random, you know, like it feels like what happens is people get observation opportunities that are structured, they, they're governed by some distribution of, you know, where they live and stuff, but um, they might, they don't have to be the same from period to period. Here, I'm sort of saying that like the math major juniors always observe the math major seniors. And so there's a link, there's a self-link in the math department. Maybe they also observe the physics major seniors. And so it's a sort of the observation opportunities are given by the structure, but they're fixed over time. And that's, that, that is um, because, and the reason we did that is because we wanted to directly compare with network theories that worked with a fixed network in a static setting, right? And so, um, but I'm, I'm with, so I think we have cases in which it's sort of a plausible interpretation, but it is an important thing to point out that the network governs sort of observations, observation locations, and it's fixed over time. Yeah, so I, I think I guess you can still have something that looks like a fixed net, network. So I guess what I'm thinking of is, you know, uh, let's say these locations are different roles in uh, in some kind of company. When I'm in uh, when, I'm, when I'm in my first year in the company, I go through some sort of a rotation. I I visit every different role. In my second year, then I, you know, I I learn from people in my in my own role, and so. I mean, it is still like a fixed right, number right. with more nodes in some sense, with yeah. with like, you know, n to the power of m or something. Like that. Yeah. So for our qualitative learning results, what will really matter is who is what your observation was the period before you act, because it's going to turn out that the be the be best you can hope for is learning really well about what happened right before you you had to take your action, and so in some sense that last period, at least for the really good learning results, is going to be is going to be a really important period. But um, but I take your point that even with a fixed network, you could imagine it being changing exactly who you observe in the in your freshman year versus your sophomore year. Right, right, right. Very good. So just to belabor this point, maybe Kevin's. I mean, I think Kevin's question in our conversation has clarified this. But to be very, it, this also relates to Francesco's question in the chat. The way we think about about this is that there is a bunch of roles, and Kevin alluded to sort of a corporate interpretation. There's a bunch of like m maybe managerial jobs. And people sort of wait to take these over. And while they're waiting, they're learning. The green people are the ones that are sort of in, in waiting and, and they're, they're learning about what they're, uh, this, the world that they're about to have to make decisions in. Then they take over for the people who are actually acting. It's their turn to take their one payoff relevant action. And at that point, they exit and that's, they don't do anything else. So for that reason, there's no dyna dy dynamic um, incentive to worry about. By the way, needless to say, these questions that are coming up, like what if the network fluctuates over time or what if they do care about dynamic incentives? Let me, let me, do let me say one thing about that. So in social learning, especially with normal models, it often comes up this question like, oh, maybe I will want to distort my action in order to, um, you know, like if I did care about the future, maybe I learn worse this period or something to, to extract more information from you. That's all conceivable. Although I wanna point out that with normals, because people's behavior are linear functions, most strategic distortions can be subtracted away. So there are results in static world social learning that say, if I try to, you know, in a normal world at least, that if I try to mess with you by always, you know, exaggerating my signal up, then you'll just be able to subtract it away. So I'll be getting a worse payoff and not actually fooling you. So it's not, I, I actually don't think strategic distortions are a huge deal here, but um, that's a, a very loose statement and I, you know, we, um, would be very curious in, in certainly in problems where there is a real strategic interaction, like my, I care about what your action is, then um, there would be reasons to um, all sorts of interesting problems that you could study in this model. I'm not given the hour, I'm not gonna say a lot about the literature. I wanted to um, also Kevin, like Krishna and Kevin have written a beautiful paper since this slide was made. Um, so I'll add that um, on, on sort of, um, information accumulation in um, overlapping generations, kind of social or like, you know, social learning model with cohorts. Um, and, um, but I guess our big, our big pitch as to what we're doing that's new is that, especially if you look on the more applied side, um, worlds that are changing are crucial to the applications of learning in, in let's say macro and Puya's, Puya's, it has a, Puya's job market paper kind of 
had learning about changing macroeconomic states along with a lot of other RBC type models. But in social learning, we've tended to focus on taking a, um, you know, a fixed state and figuring out everything about how people learn about that. There have been a few excursions into, into moving states like this paper, but um, for the most part, people stick with a fixed state and, and moving state is very little understood. Um, and then in networks, people have also um, worked on a fixed state for the most part. Uh, so we want to put, we want to just, we are interested in networks kind of for our own reasons, although some of our worlds, some of our results apply to, you know, um, settings with no real network, maybe everybody observes everybody, but we're interested in understanding both moving states and incomplete observation opportunities. And the closest analog in kind of the world is this idea of distributed common filtering. You have a bunch of people who are learning from no nice normal um, information structures, but crucially in our world, some of those normal signals I'm getting come out of somebody else's optimization. And so combining kind of an, a, a stationary equilibrium idea with the with optimal Kalman signal extraction is really the contribution to um, the learning literature, broadly speaking. Any, any questions or any, I hope I, you know, I'm, I've, I've surely been unfair to a lot of different, there's work by the way, by, um, uh, that we benefited greatly from talking to, about working paper that um, Meyer and Vives wor worked on with, uh, with sequential worlds and, um, the speed of information aggregation. So it's related to this, to that whole agenda as well. And so there's not enough room on the slide to say everyone, to, you know, to note everything that should be, um, that I should give credit to. Okay, so um, here's what we're, here's what I'm gonna claim are the main contributions of this paper. One is um, methodological, which is that we are developing a, a fairly work of, you know, in, in many ways tractable model of a stationary learning in a network about a dynamic state. And on the substantive side, we're going to sort of generalize this little toy example fact that fast aggregation allows people to use diversity of information to, re to really learn very well. And diversity of information is crucial if you have the sophistication to handle it. So if you, if you think back, you know, let me just go back. If you think on the example and, and what people had to do to learn here, they had to figure out, okay, I'm seeing the state confounded by the source's idiosyncratic signal, but in different ways. So I'd, I'd now better think about the system of equations and kind of invert it. And, and actually what people are gonna be doing is kind of cleverly using the more ignorant sources as just a way to get at the more ignorant media outlets in this case, to get a good idea of what the confound was. And they're actually gonna use, subtract away that. So I'm going to pay attention to the bad media sources so that I can do the opposite of what they say. Okay. And so that requires a fair amount of sophistication. It requires truly Bayesian, Bayesian understanding of my um, counterparties. Now we think of that as a virtue of our model because in the, in the DeGroote literature, which formally looks a lot like some of what we're doing um, in terms of the learning rules, um, people don't think carefully about what their neighbor's actions mean at all. And it's very hard to have a tractable model where people do. But in, um, on the other hand, you know, the rationality demands of this are considerable and you may or may not believe them. Fortunately, we can also study models where people are a little naive about what information means and we can study it within the same framework. But, but the, the basic, you know, the broad substance, this is a paper about learning and the substantive punchlines are that fast aggregation can happen if you have diversity of information and the sophistication to use it. Naive agents are gonna be uh, bad, badly off. And unlike, let, let's say the DeGroote model in networks, under basically no conditions does it happen that naive agents will be able to learn well. Okay, so let me stop, let me, this is a good moment to stop. Any, um, and Krishna, maybe you wanna jump in and talk about, I don't know if there's anything, yeah, I, I should have said this at the beginning. I hope it'll sort of become a conversation. So has there been anything that's come up that we wanna emphasize or clarify at this point? Um, I think maybe most of the questions have been clarifying questions, but we were just asked how important normality is, and I gave some answer, but if you want to say something about that, then you're welcome to. Yeah, we, 
Um, I don't know how much I'll, in an hour talk I can do. Maybe we can do more in the last 15 minutes. We think that the basic idea about, we think that, that in many ways there are like not, there are non-normal, it's certainly not very fragile that it could only conceivably work in a normal environment, but we do really push on normality for the tractability. So I think we do in the very last, in the concluding, I think the very last subsection of the paper, we talk about what we think we would need, we could assume in a, in a more general, under more general signal structures, and you can sort of generalize our identification conditions. To me, 90% of the economic intuition would be coming from the normal case. But I, but I do think that as, at least as a technical matter, doing those restrictions, doing the, you know, relaxing the restrictive assumptions would be um, extremely valuable. So um, I, uh, we'll tell you very briefly about, let me tell you, so we, we have half an hour to get through all the main results. I've already gotten across the main intuition. And in some sense, my goal is just to tell you this main intuition really does extend to the general world. So let me tell you what that, you know, what, let me try to convince you of that. So we're going to focus on um, time that doesn't start and fully stationary outcomes. The beauty of time, we have a stationary process of how the world evolves, stationary signal process. So we might hope in a, in a stationary world for a stationary equilibrium, right? And so um, later we're going to turn to a world where time does start in case you're curious about it. Um, and uh, our first result that kind of powers everything is that in the world with, with no starting time, there is a perfectly stationary equilibrium in linear strategies where uh, we, so we think that in general, there would be, there would in many learning settings be a stationary equilibrium, but it certainly wouldn't be linear in your observations in general, right? Um, what's really helpful is that people are adding up their observations with constant weights. So um, there is, in a stationary equilibrium, the, the junior physics majors have a constant degree of attention that they give to senior math majors. And that's just a, a part of the equilibrium. And, um, you know, people have studied in engineering, actually, algorithms that work like this with sensors that are just hard coded to behave in this way. But in our world, people are setting their weights rationally. And of course, we can ask much more interesting economic questions about that. So I'm going to be, um, I'm going to go, I'm not going to, could, could, could yeah. I ask, like, um, do you have an example of a nonlinear? <laughs> like, that seems very, Right. It's, it seems hard for me to imagine what that would even look like. So there's a paper by Jad Babai, the Jad Babai team, that in some kind of linear quadratic setting where you, where you might think that the linear equilibrium is the only one, they actually find a Pareto dominating nonlinear one, not pure learning. There's some payoff externalities there, but um, I think, but I think this is an open for, for really nerdy people. I think this is sort of an open, this is an embarrassment to a lot of papers like this, that we, it's hard to imagine what the nonlinear one would look like, but we don't, I don't think we know. Is that right, Krishna? Yeah, we, we don't have a nonlinear equilibrium or a proof that there isn't one. Yeah. Um, so I guess I do want to, so, okay. It, this is a difficult, a, a tricky point in the talk because I really do want to tell you something about, I think, the, especially given the questions that have been asked, I think people can kind of see how the mechanics are going to work. I do want to reveal the key equilibrium map, the map that determines equilibrium, but I also want to push the substantive results. So I'm going to go, this part I'll go quickly, but I think if you're interested in what's under the hood in this paper, it's all on this, on, you know, this slide and I guess the, the subsequent one. So I'm just going to, um, write out the key fixed point thing that allows us to sort of solve this model. The idea is that imagine I, we're in steady state. I'm, and you know, the people, the seniors ahead of me are playing some kind of linear strategies that are not extremely terrible that give them like a finite payoff or whatever, right? So we're in some world where people are playing linear, linear strategies that aren't too crazy. Then I can construct, I can think about the distribution of this vector, which is, I call it, you can call it sort of the error vector. Okay, so this is a vector um, with as many entries as there are nodes in the network, right? So I, I here is an N. It's just asking at time T, how far off is everybody from the thing they're trying to guess, which is theta T, right? Um, and that's a random vector because their actions are random, but I can ask sort of right before that period, what's the expectation of, I can ask what's, what's the distribution of this random vector, right? And 
it's a distribution that I would want to think about because it's extremely important for what I would like to do, um, which is learn from them, right? So if I'm at time t plus one, um, the junior who takes an action following, following these folks, then I'm going to take, um, just make sure, yeah. So what I can, my action is basically just like in the example, going to be this linear thing where all of the people I observe, all of the people in my neighborhood, I'm going to put a, a weight on them and um, take a weighted average of their, of their signals or sorry, of their actions. But of course, the way that I want to do that really depends on the, the distribution of these errors. So for example, if Krishna is always very precise and I know his, his error is, has a really small variance, then I'll want to put a lot more weight on him than, than all else equals someone whose actions tend to have a high variance. But of course, correlations will also matter. If Krishna and Kevin are telling me the same thing, I'm, that's going to matter for how, if, if their actions are very closely correlated, it's going to tell me that I shouldn't kind of give them twice, twice the weight. I shouldn't treat them as if they were independent. So the key thing is that VT, this, um, this variance covariance matrix of this thing, tells me two things. It tells me how the AI are distributed, how the AI, AJT, how everybody else's actions are actually correlated. If I know the model and I know, the, and I know um, V, then I know exactly the covariance structure of my neighbor's behavior. That's the whole point. But it also, VT plus kind of optimization or Bayes rule, right, tells me how to set the weights. So this V object is really the Rosetta Stone in that if I know V, I know everything that I might want, that, that I know everything in order to determine people's best reply behavior. And I know the distribution of the stuff that their best response, that they're actually like combining when they're best responding. And that's a long-winded way of saying is that I can define, um, I can define a map phi which is going to take last periods v and map it, or let's do it like this, last periods v and map it to a current v. It's going to tell me if everybody was correlated like this yesterday and everybody best responds, then we'll compute all these AITs and that'll give us, that'll let us calculate the new v, right? And um, it's, it's, this is exactly where we're using the magic of the normal, right? In general, you'd need to know some complicated joint distribution object, but here, you just get a map that you can write due to the magic of the normal, you can write quite explicitly. And then to show the existence of a stationary equilibrium, we just observe that it has a fixed point by Brouwer, okay? You can um, apply Brouwer and get a, get a fixed point of, um, of this map. And of course, you need a little bit of technical work to show that Brouwer applies, that things are bounded enough, but they are. And so that's where we, any questions about this proof um, or anything else? There's live commentary in the in the chat about what you're just saying. So I see the good. yeah, I see the heckling about the normal. We can... Yeah, yeah, it's me. Sorry, <laughs> but the, no, it's fine. But but you answered uh, as you as you went ahead. It's fine. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think these are the key properties that uh, you know the normality gives you and make your life exactly better, right. Exactly. You, you think you can make me feel bad about the normal distribution, but you yeah, cannot. No, no, no. No, I, I, I agree that. Um, as you, as you said, your, the, your intuition basically is, is there. So I'm pretty sure it should be there, but just it would need much, much more work to prove it with a different Yeah, way. yeah. It, I would love, you know, I, I, I myself get excited about the nerdy papers one could write trying to actually push. There's something about stationarity here that's more fundamental by a lot than linearity. So I would love to understand that better, but not today. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, thanks. So, so this is a sort of, you know, I. My, my co-authors would disclaim, I, my co-authors think I talk too much about the De Groot model. That's perhaps as you would expect. In, network, in the networks literature, there, there's a model that is a very simplistic, naive linear updating model with weights just taken exogenously. For what it's worth, here we get, we get a De Groot behavior, people just linearly aggregating friends' information, but the weights are now economic outcomes. They come out of some optimization. We can mess around with, um, we can, we can, you know, you can ask, for example, basic questions like, if I make someone a little more precise, how do the weights on them change? How, how much more important are they? How does that affect learning quality, right? And so the last thing I want to say here is that you can bring, 
so two things you could do. You could bring a better, a more realistic distribution of information and try to prove stationary equilibrium and analyze it. Or if you think that these people are too smart in that, or they know too much and that they understand the distribution um, that they're updating from, like they understand their friend's behavior very well, which they do, um, you can bring your own behavioral model of learning. Maybe what I see is that the juniors are pretty precise in, I mean, sorry, as a junior, I know that the seniors have pretty precise opinions. That's the word on the street. But the word on the street doesn't say anything about correlations. And so people have to make their decisions absent correlation information. You can encode that as just a different model of updating, a different model of the weights, and study the fixed points of that. So in that sense, the model is reasonably flexible. Okay. Um, all right. So we are going to, the, the main course of this paper is the study of what we call benchmark learning, really good learning. So I, I have to tell you that in a static world, the, what it means to learn well is, is not complicated. If, the, if you just care about yes or no, do you converge to the truth in the long run? You can also ask how fast. Here, none of that is gonna work exactly because the state is changing and all this, right? So um, we're gonna say that a person achieves the perfect aggregation benchmark if, she, if he learns as well as if he knows theta t and his own private signal. Um, at, so an agent at t plus one. What does this mean? It mean? Imagine that a little fairy came and told you what the state was yesterday, and then you had your own private signal. If you think about it, there's nothing better you could extract from neighbors, neighbors' information than yesterday's state, right? It's, it's by far the, the it's, it's a sufficient statistic for all the information they might tell you through their actions. So suppose you, you knew that, that's the best case, and you also had your private signal, you can calculate using normal updating math you know, what the variance of the equilibrium action could be. And it can't be achieved exactly because nobody has enough neighbors to exactly figure out theta last period, but, you know, you can hope. We ask whether if we give people big neighborhoods, so they see a lot of people, are they going to achieve this benchmark? Um, the hope is that if you have many signals, they're helpful for learning. The challenge is, as we saw in the example, these confounding things like the media sources idiosyncratic error are going to potentially mess us up. And so the law of large numbers needn't apply to tell us that we can infer theta. We can infer something, but it might not be theta. That's the, that's the core of the problem. And so our results is that diversity of information can be necessary. So we're going to show a general result saying without diversity, you may be screwed. You may be unable to get rid of those confounds. If Bayesians have diversity and some other structure on the environment, they're gonna be able to learn well. And something I probably won't have that much time about where I, we use these behavioral models that I just mentioned is that if you study naive agents who don't understand correlations, um, they can't do well even with diversity. So you know, there's a clear link between the, the sophistication or knowledge of, of agents about their information and whether, they, um, whether diversity can actually be used by them to learn well. Any questions? So first result I'm going to tell you is that is going to substantiate this point that you can be far from the benchmark even with um, even with Bayesians if they if their information is sort of a monoculture it's independent but it's all this it all looks the same and this is just like the media example right um, so we're going to assume memory equals one and the result says that there's a con there's an absolute constant so that for Networks, no matter how large, so for any n, right, for any network size you might be interested in, there's a unique equilibrium, unique stationary linear equilibrium. Um, ah, so there's something I failed to write here. Um, so let G be what we call a graph with symmetric neighbors. And an example of that is the complete graph, but it's slightly more general than that. I mean, in the in the undirected case, it's actually considerably more general, but complete, complete is, a decent, is a decent example to work with. So if we have a graph with symmetric neighbors, then, so there are graphs where for any n, you're just not gonna get closer to the, to the um, benchmark than some constant. There is a unique stationary linear equilibrium and in it, all, all agents are gonna learn considerably worse than the perfect aggregation benchmark. You know, if they took, if they observed a bunch of people who had independent, just, revealed in independent information about the state, they would learn at the benchmark. But um, 
So I guess here, let G be complete, right? I guess, and then I take, say the symmetric neighbors thing below, but here, if we just have the complete graph, which is sort of the simplest example, everybody sees everybody. Um, so they're just gonna be bounded away from learning in the best equilibrium. And that generalizes the intuition from the, from the um, example. In the example, there was this one source that was messing things up. Here, it's a little different because there's no, there's no central node actually, right? There's in, in, a, in, De Groot, in the standard static De Groot model, people would be learning really well here about the unchanging state because nobody is central, nobody is gonna mess it up by being observed too much. Nevertheless, because of these kind of more subtle confounding reasons, um, people learn imperfectly. And I can give you a, a quick intuition, um, which is that basically someone who's learning at time t is just observing the social signal, the information they can get from their, from their social um, observations just has to be formed by taking an average of what other people are doing with equal weights because everybody looks the same. But those people yesterday actually all care, all pay, placed weight on T minus one actions, which the T plus one person would rather not have in their, in their actions. So everybody's always using the same weights and that's sort of the intuition. I, I think I'm not gonna have time to sort of completely nail this intuition, but the picture I wanna leave you with is kind of a tumbleweed. Because nobody can filter, everybody has to just take the average of their neighbor's information whatever confounds were in the neighbor's information are go going to also be in your actions. And in fact, they're gonna move the average action of the whole population. So this is the community, a tumbleweed, I don't know how popular this object is, but it's, I, um, you can, it's like this big ball that rolls along and picks up junk. And so a, a signal monoculture, a world where everybody has the same type of signal um, is like a tumbleweed. It just um, picks up noise and, and people can't filter. And the key, if you, many people are curious in the chat about more general signal structures. So the key condition preventing good learning is that the dimensionality of the relevant state updates, which in this case is just one dimensional, but could be, could be more general, exceeds the identification power afforded by people's social neighborhood. So if you had a two dimensional state, um, you, would need, you would need more, you know, you could generalize this, this tumbleweed intuition to a two-dimensional state or a 10-dimensional state. The key thing is that there's not enough diversity of behavior I see to help me figure out all the relevant confounds in the, in the information and filter them out. And that's gonna to lead to this tumbleweed accumulation of error. Um, there's a, so what, let's just stick with the complete graph with two signal variances, sigma A and sigma B, okay? And what I'm gonna show you visually is what this, what this Look, what learning problem looks like. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to vary um, sigma b, that's on the x-axis, and sigma a is fixed at two. Okay, so let's look at what this what this um, graph looks like at n equals infinity when you have a lot of people. The result I just showed you says that you're going to be, so this is actually benchmark learning done here. Benchmark people A having a variance that's as good as they could get in, you know, with perfect information about yesterday. I've shown you that at, with at least in the complete graph, when these two variances are exactly the same, um, people's learning is gonna be far from the benchmark. The next result I'm gonna, so that's, that's kind of result one. And result two is gonna tell you that when they're at all different in the large network limit, um, under conditions, people are going to learn at the benchmark, for example, in the complete graph. So the question is, um, what happens, you know, this looks very discontinuous and a little goofy for that reason. Um, but um, if you wanted to actually look at how this looks in a community of 200 people, you see that, you know, a little diversity doesn't immediately get you, like what you expected at, at the asymptotic outcome is like going direct, you know, going down to here discontinuously. But if with 200 people, you know, you need considerable diversity, but as you get more diversity, you get closer to the benchmark. And I wanna point out a sort of counterintuitive feature of this, that if, as we go in this direction, the group B people are getting dumber, they're getting worse at estimating the state, but the group A people are actually able to learn better as a result from that, right? So I like when my counterparties have worse information about the state because it makes them more useful informants about the confounds. Um, and so there's a non monotonicity which you certainly would not see in a more naive or mechanical model of how people update. 
Any, um, let me stop here and ask for any questions. Uh, I, just a reminder, 10 minute warning. Perfect. Okay, so I wanna, um, so, you know, then we did this for all the other, we did this for um, 400, 600. You can see that as the population gets bigger, you need less diversity to sustain really good learning. But um, this is what the curves really look like. So you can ask a bunch of really, you could ask a bunch of finite world, you could ask a bunch of questions that make sense in this finite world, like um, how influential are group A people? Um, how much does their, do their, does their information affect the state versus the other people? Um, and we've actually been recently, I, given that I have 10 minutes left, I'm not gonna be able to get into this, these new results that Krishna and I actually just got last week, but um, we, we were able to um, characterize various comparative statics of how the you know, influence and other stuff looks here as we, um, as we vary the uh, primitives of the environment. But we're not, I'm happy to talk about that at the end. The last thing I wanna tell you before time is up is actually um, our best, I told you a bad learning result. I'm now gonna tell you in brief our best good learning result, okay? And to make this result stronger than it would otherwise be, I'm going to move to a world with a beginning of time. I could do this result also in the purely stationary world, but this is gonna give me uniqueness of outcomes in a way that I like. So, and I also wanna demonstrate that the model does make predictions if you don't believe in this universe that never started, okay? So here, theta zero is the initial state is gonna be drawn from the stationary distribution of the state process. Agents are gonna initially use their own signals that gives rise to an initial variance covariance structure. And then everybody best responds to what was going on yesterday, much like Smith and Sorensen or any of, you know, that's the sa exact same pattern you have in any social learning paper, BHW. Um, and it's gonna, you know, we're gonna be able to use our phi map that we figured out earlier to understand how this V is gonna evolve over time. And our main result is gonna be that in flexible random networks that are going to give us some tractability that we need, if we have each sufficient, if we have each person having access to diverse sources, just like in the good case of the media example, um, then good aggregation is actually gonna obtain and people are going to learn well, right? So there's, there's a, that's a counterpoint to the bad learning result. With diversity, Bayesians learn well. Um, and um, I'll be rather informal about this, but we the model we need a little bit of of structure in order to we can't analyze even for large n. We don't have good tools yet for analyzing what happens on arbitrary networks, but we can consider a rather flexible type of stochastic network where you have finitely many network types, an arbitrary matrix of probabilities of linking between different network types. And um, that's just sort of specified totally flexibly. Then I generate a large network from this probability matrix. And I'm gonna assume this is the signal diversity condition that I need to power good learning. The signal diversity condition is gonna say that each neighborhood has many individuals, each of, each of, uh, and, and, um, in each neighborhood, there are at least two signal types. So Krishna's type sees at least two different signal types. Um, and actually I'll be, to, I need, think I need to add to this within the same network type. So um, you might, you can weaken this condition somewhat, but the idea is that basically people have, nobody, the simplest way to say is nobody has to deal with neighbors that, um, all have all have the same type of private information. That's really what's going to create confounding problems. So um, this is the same thing in, in writing. You have a large random network, many network types with given population shares, probabilities of those network types being linked. Each each person, each agent has one of many possible signal variances. So there's also signal types, right? And so there's some joint distribution of network and signal position, which sort of captures a general notion of you know a big network with maybe lots of different you know courses going on and uh, the sort of the P's tell you how people observe other people in um, you know the junior physics majors may observe the math majors who tend to take this particular course with some probability things like that um, okay and so under in this world the theorem and this is the last result I'll say um, is that when 
when this, con when this um, signal diversity condition holds, for any epsilon you give me, I can promise you that actually with probability one minus epsilon, the right after the, after the first period of learning, all agents are gonna suddenly have variances that are within epsilon of the perfect aggregation benchmark and they're gonna stay there. So the first period, I mean, the first period intuition is easy to understand, right? Because you see people who act only based on their private signal. And so you have a lot of great information about the you know, initial first period state and you're gonna learn it and then take the best action. More remarkably, you're never going to go away from that. Once everybody's taking actions that are really smart, they're going to provide the kind of input to other people that other people can filter and keep and stay really smart next period too. And so, you know, I couldn't get this much stronger because given the randomness in the network realization, maybe I just realize an empty network. Um, um, you, right, with, with, uh, with an empty network, nobody could learn well because they don't have access. To, but, but with the network, when the network is nice, is large is you know dense enough and some other conditions hold we do get to learn well the proof is is hard um and my you know my co-authors did and I'll, i i kind of can't take much credit for this proof but it's it's a very the one the one liner i'll say about it is that like i just told you that starting from period zero you kind of immediately go to a good learn a pretty good learning outcome where you achieve the benchmark but you have to prove you stay there so the at an extremely high level, an idea in the proof is that if you just use the fact that you're somewhere in this nice set of benchmark learning outcomes, sort of the wrong color, if you're just, if I just worked with the set of learning outcomes where learning is good, that wouldn't be enough to prove you stay there. That doesn't give me enough technical conditions to prove that nobody's going to somehow, you know, if I could only prove you're somewhere in here, then maybe the problem would be that next period you could escape in there. But we actually define a more stringent subset of this good learning set, where not only is learning good, but it's good with further kind of, you know, there aren't any magical correlations that might disrupt learning. And we can prove that we go there, and we can prove that once you go there, you stay there. And so the subset of benchmark learning um, is actually an invariant set under the updating map I've been telling you about, and that says that you that you go to this, state, this nice learning area and stay there. Um, and at all the points that you are at the whole, wherever you are, as you walk around here, you're always gonna be in, at good learning. Um, and if you want, there's also a stationary equilibrium somewhere here. So if I, if I thought about this, the purely stationary model, there is a stationary equilibrium somewhere here by Brouwer um, where everybody learns well. There could conceivably other, be other bad equilibria though we don't uh, really think that there are. Okay, uh, that's it. So that's all I, naive agents can't do any of the smart stuff. Everything is bad. Um, and then we did a bunch of other stuff um, that I'm happy to talk about, but social learning with a moving target, diversity is important. Um, that might mean that you wanna have some people who have really good signals because people can use them really effectively to filter out social learning confounds. We introduced this fixed pointology, kind of giving De Groot style updating rules as a rational, optimizing outcome. And, um, and, we're, and we are increasingly interested in comparative statics. I saw that this came up in the chat, comparative statics and other things that would be valid in real world, small net, real world looking small networks. Our theory can also do that. It just happened to be that the first results we could prove that were good enough were about the large network learning questions, but we are extremely interested in comparative statics of small networks, um, which I see other people are also perhaps interested in too. That's it. Um, I will stop here and uh, be, be very happy to have conversation. Thank you very much. You're right on time. Um, uh, this is a very good time. Um, so we are moving to Q&A session now. Um, um, well, let's start with um, uh, Kevin. Do, do, are there any uh, remarks or questions that you have um, before we move to the audience? Yeah, I do have one question which relates to your um the set of results about comparing naive and bayesian agents i don't know if you have, if you have that graph you can put that yeah. up the... so maybe i'll just say yeah, a very... like, yeah this one's perfect right so Let me just we... say, i'll just quickly say what this is all we did oh, sure, is sure. we solved the naive version of our model where people aren't smart enough to, to to you know the people basically 
treat their neighbor's actions in a Eister Rabin kind of way where they tr think they're just based on private information alone. They weight people with better private information more, but you know, you can see that relative to the curve we saw for Bayesian agents, the naive agents have word learning that's um, very different and doesn't have this, you know, as, as B gets dumber, the learning just gets worse for everyone. Now your question. Yeah, so, right. So it's so, just so on this, right? So if I imagine starting at a world where group A and group B have the same signal variance and, and, and sort of making group, group B, you know, have noisier signals, uh, I, I guess two, I want one is sort of whether that helps or not somehow depends on, you know, uh, sort of the assumptions we want to make about the rationality of, of, of the subjects, like wh wh whether such an intervention would help people learn better s somehow depends on whether we think people are able to do this Bayesian updating or whether they're naive. And I guess a related point is somehow if I do make them noisier and then I see better learning, that seems to be like a testable way to distinguish between, you know, Bayesian social learning and naive social learning, because that, that's like a really weird thing to have when people were just being naive or, or, or like, I don't know, not, 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 not using social learning or something like that. Yeah, that, I, I really like that point. Krishna, do you have anything, any re reactions or anything? I think we should obviously, I think, you know, I'll actually, I hope Krishna can sort of lead this post discussion, but I, I agree with everything Kevin said. Do we have anything to add? No, nothing. So, yeah, that's a good point. Thanks. So, what about like under the, if I wanted to consider some notion of like overall social welfare and not just like one group's variance? Yeah. Um, we, so here we just focused on, we, we, there, there, it's only, it's just purely an accounting, a bookkeeping reason that we plot the group A variance on the Y axis, because we don't want to be like, there's a mechanical reason that the group B variance will be changing because the group, so we don't want to, but we, we could do, we've recently, what we've been doing is comparative statics on influence. We've been asking as, you know, our model predicts that as group B, the rational model, as group B gets dumber, people are going to be using them even when, even before weights get negative, people are basically going to be pay, putting less weight on them and more weight on the, on the smart group. And that's a way of sort of putting more weight on the new information and less weight on the confounding garbage. Um, so we could do those comparative statics. And in principle, you could then feed them through the welfare functional and ask those questions. So we haven't, we haven't done that, but I, I, you know, just the first paper is what it, what it is, but I think the hope for this is that we could have a sort of structural stationary model of learning. And then whatever you might do to such a model, like think about it, you know, try to calibrate parameters from observed covariances, or, you know, look at, look at perturbations and see which way they move things and then ask welfare questions. Like this is a social learning model where you could in principle directly do those exercises. We haven't done them yet, but I think the questions you're asking about welfare, for example, are really what would motivate. I think it seems to me that it might be really hard to get like very big abstract results about that, but you could certainly get concrete numbers for a network that you cared about. Um, yeah, I'll just add the group B variances, you can sort of calculate from this and the only difference is they have different private signals and put different weights on them. Uh, but if, for example, you looked at what we call the social signal variance, which is sort of the variance of your guests based on your social information, but not putting in your private information that would look exactly the same across the two groups. And so this isn't sort of hiding anything non-mechanical about what's going on in group B. Yeah, that's a really good way of, of saying what, this is probably a better way of saying what this picture depicts. Qu questions from the, from other, I mean, I'm, I'm happy, yeah, I'm happy to have, take questions from anybody. Exactly, exactly. So uh, I just wanted to encourage everyone, if uh, you have any other questions, the audience, uh, please unmute yourself and, and fire away. Hi. Um, can I ask? Please say hello. Go on, go on. Yeah, so you emphasized a lot the heterogeneity in the signal distributions. I wonder if, in some sense, heterogeneity in the network structure of the groups that I observe could substitute for this. I mean, so I can have in mind one, think of me observing just two different groups, but within these groups, there's very different structure, whether this could help. What do you think, Krishna? Um, yeah, so the answer is more or less, not nearly as much as you would think. 
there's sort of a there's a sort of uninteresting way in which it can help, which is let's say I have a bunch of people who don't observe anyone, then these people are going to be helpful to me, but they're not going to be doing well. But in some sense, that's the only way it can really help. And so we have some results about that essentially say heterogeneity and network structure can't sort of lead to everyone learning as well as heterogeneity and signal structure can. Um, and yeah, this wasn't sort of a priori obvious to us, but it's saying as long as sort of everyone has some observations, um, it's really the signal structure that matters and not the network. I guess the other thing that I'll mention that could matter is if you have heterogeneity and behavioral roles. So you have some people who are rational or some people who are somewhat naive or something like that. Um, yeah, making some mistakes and that can play the same role as heterogeneity and signal, but it needs to be sort of heterogeneity in information or in, um, or in behavior and not actually social position. Yeah, I, that's a, I, I love the question, Pisa. I think we were really, I mean, yeah, like network, the, our results on this compared to our intuitions are very, very weak. Our, but uh, after playing with a thousand examples, we've decided basically that that no amount of network, we can't, the network heterogeneity can really move you away from this constant amount of, of, of bad, badness relative to the benchmark. Um, the results we have will only say that your learning in general can't be can't be at the same rate um, in the population size as, as it is, you know, we, we can, we can show a lower bound that's, that's worse than the bet that's, you know, worse than what you get under benchmark learning. But um, we think there's a lot of room. We think there's some deep reason that we don't yet fully understand that the network can't help nearly as much as we hope. Yeah. I was going to ask if you had a kind of a good intuition for this, but it seems, it seems not yet. I mean, the basic intuition is that the basic intuition is what everybody really cares about is the state. And so the way that the, there's going to be this confound of old news, old changes to the state that I don't care about, but that my neighbors cared about. And if they, unless they were able to filter, I mean, unless they were able to filter really well, that's going to be in there, no matter what their networks are like. So at least that says it's consistent. They have bad networks, so they give me bad stuff. Now, the fact that just the network alone can't like magically break you out of this thing is is it very interesting but i yeah i could i could babble but i think you're i think you're rightly pushing us to really nail down what's going on and i think maybe we'll understand but we, we don't quite yet yeah no it's, it's interesting thanks uh, going back to this question about an endogenous uh, networks you know if if you could imagine some sort of authority that could ban some links and therefore you know seize that 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 confounding effect of, of other people and forcing people to to rely on their own signals would that would that help you think so this goes back to the to the question about uh, you know would network help but a targeted intervention yeah krishna what do we think about that yeah i mean i guess i don't have anything much deeper than the answers that we just gave but um, this is saying, unless you're willing to sort of sacrifice some people and say, you're not going to learn well, but you're going to help everyone. There's not that much scope for, or if the network is very disconnected. So people only see a few people, then adding more connections might help. But if you have a reasonably connected network, there's not that much scope for network interventions to help that much. And so this might be saying, this is sort of not the right channel to be focusing our policy on in this world. Um, there's certainly other learning models where it can matter a lot. Thanks. Um, do we have other questions? Can I? Oh, oh Angel has one. Angel, go ahead. Oh, you, go ahead. No, go ahead. Mine is, uh, I'm so going out on a limb, Angel. So you're probably asking okay. a better question than mine. Okay, so I mean, mine is, is is basically an interpretation question. I mean, it's I mean, it's something that is confounding me because I mean, the way you portray your results, I mean, I understand it makes sense in in your model of with a network is that heterogeneity may help uh, learning. Okay, but the way I interpret heterogeneity is that you know more, you know more about the population. Again, I mean, in your setting, I mean, it makes sense to define heterogeneity this way. But if you think more generally, if you know nothing, basically you think that everybody is the same. It is actually that you know something about the population that actually helps you in your learning, which now it makes, you know, it sounds like a more 
you know, I mean, like a more standard story. And, and that's basically what's confusing me a little bit because I'm not sure whether you're basically, your model is basically about what type of information is more helpful to learn, okay? Yeah. Rather so, than, yeah. That's a great, no, that's a great point. So I want to say one thing. First, I mean, if I, suppose I'm just dropped in an environment that I don't know much about, but I think your point that this is both heterogeneity and knowledge of it is crucial. It might be that I come to this college that I don't know anything about, but I quickly see based on just basically based on sampling a few periods of the past that these people seem to be really dumb and these people seem to be really smart, not because I know that about them, but because I can guess from their actions and ex post observations of the state or even just how close their actions are to each other, right? That tells me who's precise and who's not. Um, I, I could bootstrap, I could hope to bootstrap this identification material off of observations that I see, but it's not at all in our world. We just take Bayesian equilibrium. And so I completely agree that we're, we're sort of stapling those two together. And I think for, it's very hard to do in canonical rational models, but I think it's extremely interesting to ask how well could people bootstrap learning in a heterogeneous environment? Maybe you need, you know, if it's not too much heterogeneity, you might not have enough to sort of put the right weights, right? So. Thank you. What was Francesco's out on the limb question? Um, so I was thinking, so it's, you, you, you have these, uh, these networks and everything, um, and particularly the precisions are fixed, but um, what if somebody could make investments in knowledge? That's what I was going, uh, I mean, I'm, I guess it's not, uh, and I think it's going out on a limb because, I mean, that I'm really confused because at that point, you, you know, the naive uh, conclusion I would draw from what you've presented is, oh, you, you actually want some people not to make the investment and you want others to do it, to do so and so on, um, which is interesting, I suppose. But then this common knowledge, I mean, okay, an equilibrium would be there, but you know, what if you can't see what the investment they've made? Then the whole thing starts. Yeah, yeah right? So yeah. I don't know. Have you thought about it? I, I mean, I, I, it's out on a limb thing because I, I, I couldn't think my way through it, but maybe you have. No, and Daja, I think I don't have any, I don't have anything, any, I don't have anything smart to add, but I think that's, a, I think it's clearly interesting to endogenize um, signal production. You could also, in principle, endogenize observation opportunities, right? And then I guess with, given the conversation with Kuitsa that, that, signal signal stuff is maybe more important than network stuff but sort of i mean one obvious implication is that if i make it harder for some people to gather information about this thing that can help if other people use it intelligently um and but maybe another thing and more maybe a more so i like i, I kind of like the question of interventions in general we it's easier to kind of daydream and chat about than to put in the paper but i think one thing that that could be useful a useful thought is maybe just what do you tell people about? There's also information about other people's waiting rules and other people's signal structure, right? So the kind of the exchange with Anhel makes me think that you know sometimes you might be able to improve things just by saying actually these people aren't that informed about the state. Maybe that should you know in our model that would mean that people can learn better um, if than if they didn't know that. But I I I think endogenizing signal acquisition is is um, important, and I don't know. I'm with you that we don't quite know what exactly to say about it at the end of the day. Krishna? I, I guess on the question uh, yeah. of endogenous uh, signal production, um, it seems like that's going to be a setting where heterogeneity and network position will lead to heterogeneous signal acquisition, though, because you can have different people are probably going to choose different positions unless they're perfectly symmetric in the network. Uh, Right, so so it seems like in that world, it, it, that 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 how people use it will endogenously lead to some heterogeneity in, in the position. Yeah. yeah, no, that's very interesting. I don't think we've, I haven't thought about that. Um, I'll just add a simple point to Francesca's that we make in the paper that's maybe relevant to what Francesca's asking about. Sort of, does the policy and maker want to uh, give some people worse information, which is we think maybe this makes more sense in a world where you have a couple of different state processes that you're learning about and you have to decide sort of do how do I allocate people's maybe attention or precision between them and then what our results are saying is essentially you would want to have some people be experts in one of the state processes other people be experts in another and so 
this is maybe where diversity makes more sense than just saying some people have better information than others. But if you have some people focused on one state process and less focused on the other, and other people with the reverse focus, then that's going to end up giving you what you want. I think it's a good moment to uh, stop the recording. But before we stop the recording, let me officially thank uh, the speaker, Ben, uh, Krishna for, for the conversation, and Kevin for, for paneling, and all the audience. Um, see you next week.